life it's the life as God has it there is no death in that life when you believe the gospel you are obeying the gospel by doing so you are obeying God your obedience to the instruction in the meeting is what connects you to the flow of the spirit in the meeting is what connects you to the flow of the anointing in the meeting your prayer life is the temperature of your Christian life your faith must be in the law the blood of Jesus is something the devil cannot stand. Thank you for all trance in the Holy Ghost. And by your anointing, Lord, I ask that you bring your people into understanding and experience of your word. And that your name be glorified. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said it loud. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Greet about five persons and welcome them to service with a smile tonight. And you may be seated. When you find your number five, glory to God. All right, so get right into the word a little earlier this evening so we can have two hours of teaching at least. Amen. And then so we can also close at about 8.30 p.m. Is that all right? And I'm happy that a lot of you have come early. So that's good. Amen. So last week we said a few things. Now, one of the things I wrapped up with last Wednesday is the importance of using your voice and speaking loud. The word of faith, that is speaking the word of God and opening your mouth to alter God's word. You know, like I said, I think a, a whole lot of us Christians, what's happening? I still, we're yet to understand the importance and the effect as well as the power of the spoken word. And um, that's why we're looking at this subject anyway. Because Manifestation is tied to confession. Manifestation is tied to confession. If there is no confession or declaration, you would not see manifestation. At the point of salvation, and this is one of the things we tried to explain last week, you need to understand what happened and when it happened. Man is saved at the point of believing. All right? The moment you believe, you actually get saved from that point. John 3, 16, 17 and 18, and if you like 19 as well, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, look at that, believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then in 17, he says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Then in 18, he said, he that believeth, did you see, shall not be condemned, or is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. And he tells us why. He says, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So notice, the one who believes is not condemned. The one who believes not is condemned because he did not believe. The believing is the key. In 19, he says, this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And what he sums up in 
uh, to sum up what he said in verse 19, he's simply saying, men rejected light. The opposite of rejecting light is to believe. And again and again, you see in the Gospels, you see in the Epistles, believing is how a man is saved. Believing is how a man is saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Romans 10.10, 10, and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, the confession is to attest and acknowledge that which has happened. And by the way, the purpose of that acknowledgement through confession is to have an experience. I'll say that again. The purpose of the confession of what has happened is so that the one to whom it happened can now begin to experience what has happened. I'll repeat it again. The purpose of the confession, when it says in Romans 10, 10, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's like speaking unto something that is speaking about what has happened, that like reporting, declaring, agreeing, acknowledging, affirming what has happened. And again, the purpose of the confession is to experience what has happened. You see, the new life, the new birth, comes with new experiences. When a man is born again, he begins to experience new things. The old is gone. 2 Corinthians 5, the 17th verse, says the new is come. One translation puts it that way. And the new, he says, all these new things, verse 19, I mean 18 of 2 Corinthians 5, are of God. What are those new things? The new things that you will now begin to experience. The God kind of righteousness. The holiness of God. The boldness of God. The liberty of songs. The faith of God. Those things are experiences you're going to have. Because when you walk by righteousness, you're going to experience new things. When you begin to live by faith, you are going to experience a new dimension of life. But all that is going to become your experience as you proclaim as you declare, that's why Psalm 107 verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Notice, they don't say it to be redeemed. They believe to be redeemed. But they must say what has happened to them now that they have, rede they have they've been redeemed. All right? In other words, as the Lord redeemed you, then tell it. Proclaim it. That's where the experience lies. And that's what I mean by manifestation. Are you getting this somebody? And it works with everything God will do in your life. As God healed you, then tell it. As God blessed you, then tell it. As God prospered you, then tell it. You have to say what God has done. But the way to access what God has done is to believe it. Is to believe it. In the house of Cornelius... Acts 10 and verse 43 and 44, Peter began to speak to them and said to him, gave all the prophets witness that whosoever believed in him should have or receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spake, verse 44, the Bible says the Holy Ghost fell on all that heard him. Of course, the implication of all that heard him here is all that heard and believed. They heard and believed. So the believing is how a man is saved. But the confession is what brings the experience. It brings you into the experience as a matter of fact. In other words, you are not going to experience what you don't confess. Even though it's a reality. But you are not going to experience what you do not confess. What you do not profess. And so we looked at that last week. You've got to say it. You've got to declare it. You've got to proclaim. Can you see that? What he has done. You've got to say what God has done. And that the principle, the law of faith works by believing and saying. That's the way it works. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 13 
We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it's written, I believe. Therefore have I spoken, we also believe. And therefore we speak. So that is how the law of faith works. Because you need to understand faith is a law. And faith is also a spirit. There is the spirit of faith, there is the law of faith. Romans, the third chapter, the 27th verse. Paul writing to the Romans said to them, where is boasting then? He said it is excluded. He said by what law? He said the law of works. He said of works, that is, is by the law of works. He said nay or nehi. He said but by the law of faith. The word law there is the Greek word nomos. And it actually means a principle. So in other words, Paul makes us see that faith is a law. A principle, in other words. And you see, a principle is a set of acts or actions that have predictable consequences. A principle is a set of actions that have predictable consequences. That's why you have things like the law of gravity. And whatever goes up must come down. Did you see what happened to it? It had to come down. If I'm going to get it, I have to pick it. Amen. You lost your chance to be blessed. Amen. Glory to God. It's a law of gravity. Amen. And that principle states that once something goes up, I'm not going to do it again. All right. It must come down. So coming down is the predictable consequence of going up. You see, ah, if coming down is the consequence of going up, how do we rise higher and higher? We don't go up, we grow up. And we don't just even go up, we are lifted up. And underneath are the everlasting house. <laughs> so when he lifts you, you can never come down. Because when God lifts you, he doesn't remove his hand. He said the eternal God is in the book of Psalms, look for it for me, is our refuge. And he said, and underneath are the everlasting house. You know, I remember that scripture. It was in our family church when I was growing up. We used to have what they call the anchor for the year, every year. So we grew up in those kind of churches. The Yoruba word for it is akomono. <laughs> we used to have anchor for the year. Our anchor for the year, when I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, was what I just recited to you. The eternal God is our refuge. You know, it's amazing as I'm growing in, in my work with God, I'm beginning to realize in retrospect, some of the things we do by faith now, they, they were doing it in my family church when I was growing up. That anchor of the year, we used to recite it every day in my house at the end of our family devotion. And we used to recite it in our church at the end of every service. We now call it closing charge. We just modernized it. That's why no, I'm doing such a family church. Yeah. <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm saying? All right, that's it. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. Are you seeing this somebody? So you've got to speak. He walks by believing and saying, please be seated. It's the law. And what that means is if you are going to enjoy a law, you need to understand that law. And so Paul says it's a law of faith in Romans 3, 27. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 13, he sees, he, we see there he says it's uh, the spirit of faith. He says, we also have in the spirit of faith. And it tells us how the spirit of faith works. It believes and then it speaks. You can't just stop at believing. You must say what you believe. The Lord Jesus Christ teaching about faith in Mark 11, 23 and 24 said, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Can you see that? He said, he mentioned saying the same path at least thrice as much as he did the believing part. Now, the believing is very important. You need to understand that. In fact, I can tell you, I believe strongly as I've seen in the world and I see in practice 
The speaking is more than the believing because the speaking helps the believing. I'll say that again. The speaking part is more than the believing that is in the mention of it, in the emphasis of it. And one of the reasons, and I believe the major reason, is because the speaking helps the believing. I've told you many times, the heart of man is designed by God to believe what it hears from the mouth. That is, your heart is designed to believe what it hears from your mouth. From your own mouth. That it is what you are saying that your mouth believes the most. Are you getting this, somebody? Hallelujah. Glory to God. So it's, it's by believing and speaking. You see, there is no silent faith. There is no silent faith. Faith speaks. Faith always speaks. And we can look at it all through from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Every person, in fact, if you go to Hebrews 11, every person you see in Hebrews 11 listed there, they were men who spoke. They were women who spoke. They said something. And that's what the Lord Jesus was saying. That if you believe in your heart and not doubt. That's what I told you. That believe and not doubt in your heart is good. The major work to achieve that is going to be done by your own mouth. If your heart will believe and not doubt, your mouth has to do the job to bring your heart to that state. To believe and not doubt. So it means it's possible to believe and doubt. There's a case of a man like that in Mark 9. Brought his son to Jesus. Jesus said, do you believe? He said, I believe, Lord, help my own belief. He believed, but he also doubted. That's why James said, let him ask, but nothing wavering. Do you see that? Because sometimes people believe God can do it, and then, you see, that's why there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is oscillating. He believes one moment, he doubts, he doesn't believe the next moment. It's moving back and forth. And James makes us see that that kind of thing hinders people from receiving from God. In other words, you need stability to receive. Stability of conviction, stability of faith to receive anything from God. You must be stable. And don't get worried. If you find yourself in that state of believing and doubting, Father Abraham was there, I told you last Sunday. I mean, last Wednesday, right? But you'll notice he got out of that space. And you too can. And the job is going to be done by your mouth. You will school your heart into conviction as you speak the word of God. In fact, at that level of speaking, what you're actually doing is meditation. Because you're actually speaking to yourself. It's like you are convincing yourself. You are exposing your heart to the light of the word. You see, when you're speaking the word of God like that, it's like you're opening the windows of your heart so that the light of the word can penetrate into that heart and influence that heart. And erase all doubt till you get to a point like the great man of God or a robot used to say, where you know that you know that you know that you know that you can never doubt again. Beloved, there is a point like that. <laughs> where you know that you know that you know that you know that you can never doubt anymore. Because it's already settled in your heart. But your mouth has to do that job to school your heart into faith. To school your heart into faith. And you keep saying and saying and saying. And you see, you can't be talking doubt and talking faith at the same time. No. You must make up your mind where you're going to be. Even when your heart is bombarded by thoughts of doubt. I showed you that last week in Proverbs 31. I mean Proverbs 30 rather. Let's go there. I still want us to come back to Matthew 21 and 21. Well, let's first go to Proverbs. Give me three hallelujahs. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody say, I love the word of God. So that's part of schooling your heart into faith. Say, I love the word of God. <laughs> 
right, so Proverbs 30, verse 32. He said, if thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, he said, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. In other words, don't say everything that comes to your mind. Especially when you're under pressure. And then you hear people say, I feel like giving up. Why? Now, feeling like giving up is one thing. Doesn't mean you've made a blunder of your faith. No, that's just a feeling. The thoughts are there. Do you know your thoughts and your feelings work with each other? When you feel a certain way, the next thing that happens is the thought of that feeling rises in your mind. And whenever that happens to you as a believer, the word of God says, put your hand on your mouth. In other words, don't say that thing that is in your mind. Especially when you know it's contrary to the word of God. Hold it, don't say it. If you can do that, the next thing is the word of God begins to rise inside of you. Or you look for the word of God so that you can say what the word says. That's how you've got to stock up on God's word. Have a lot of word inside of you. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom. You've got to store up God's word. Store up God's word. You go to Job 22, 21. Let's go there. We're not far from there. If you followed me to Proverbs 30, you're just two books away from Job. And you go to the 22nd chapter. And we read you from the 21st verse. Oh, you love it. Acquaint now thyself with him, that is with the Lord, and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. He said, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his word in thine heart. Lay up his words in thine heart. You've got to stop. Stop. You've got to lay God's word like somebody laying up a treasure or laying up treasures. And like why Jesus said it, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart will bring forth good things. A believer must have a rich deposit of the word of God so you can bring out the treasure of God's word in the face of the situations and circumstances of life. The child of men Christians, they have nothing. They've stored up inside. So they have no answer. They have no answer. That's why they're always in their feelings and they're always talking their feelings. I feel like giving up. I feel confused. I feel it's not going to work. That's because there is no word inside you. And sometimes because there is more of the world in you than the word in you. What you are filled with is what will come out of you. That's what Jesus said. A good man out of the good treasures, Luke 6, 45. A, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart, bring it for that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, bring it for that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Let the word dwell richly in you. So that from the abundance of the word in you, you're speaking. And when the word fills you in abundance, you're going to be speaking life, wholeness, healing. I remember a woman of God, she got caught up in a fire incident many years ago. In fact, we had invited her husband and he couldn't come because of the fire incident. It was so bad, she was affected more, or most, of all the people. It was so bad. And I was told she was being wheeled into the ICU. And she's a medical doctor. She knows that place quite well. A lot of people never come out alive from that place. And I was told that she was being wheeled into that place. Almost losing, I mean, almost like life leaving her body. She kept on speaking the word, even with the little strength she had. I choose life. I choose life. I choose life. She's alive. This thing happened about eight or nine years ago. She's alive. <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm saying? She's alive, not just alive, she's alive and well, preaching the gospel, fulfilling God's plan for her life. Glory to God. But in that moment, the abundance, what was in the abundance of her heart was coming out of her mouth. I choose life. I choose life. 
You know, Father Lord tells the story all the time. The woman who was like the chair person at their wedding reception when they got married uh, several decades ago. She's the queen in one of, you know, one of the very biggest queens in Yoruba land at that time. Old woman comes to go to the Lord now. And at that time, even though she was old, she was sick and she, she went into a coma. But before she went into a coma, they said she had been saying it, I shall not die, but I shall live to declare the works of the Lord. And, you know, and she kept on saying that and saying that. She came out of the coma. Because those were her last words in her consciousness. Now imagine that woman when she was getting close to that point where life was coming out of her body. Imagine her just saying, in her mind, I believe. And she didn't say it out. She would die believing. She would have died believing. Because we are told, for one, that the angels act on the voice of the word, not on the thought. Are you saying this? The same part is so important. And I told you, that's one area I believe and I have seen Satan is attacking a lot of Christians in that area. Very few Christians can lift up their voice. Sometimes even in church, people can't even lift up their voices in church. Not to talk of when they are by themselves at home, by yourself in your car. You've got to learn how to lift up your voice. You see, anything that hinders you from lifting up your voice is not of God. It's not. It's not. Because whatever hinders you from lifting your voice to speak God's word has already robbed you of what the word of God is supposed to do in your life. I'll say that again. Whatever hinders you from lifting up your voice has already hindered you from whatever the word of God is supposed to do in your life. And that means defeat. That means failure. That's what it means. Robbery. Don't let the devil rob you. You've got to say what the word says. You've got to declare boldly. Whether it is in preaching it to other people or in speaking the word over ourselves, it requires us opening our mouth and speaking with our voices and lifting up our voices. I shall say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he is my fortress, he is my God in whom I trust. Hallelujah. You must say it all through the life of Jesus. He believed in God, but he kept saying it. He kept saying it. He didn't stand before the fig tree looking at it, saying, I believe in my heart. I know this fig tree. If I talk to it, it will believe. It will obey me. Out. So there's no need to talk. You can imagine Jesus looking at the fig tree, moping at it. No. The Bible says in Mark 11, 14, he spoke to the fig tree and his disciples heard him. That was, it was loud enough for the people around him to hear. And I like the emphasis of Mark when he says, they heard it. They heard it. So the voice was articulate. And it was loud enough. Sometimes people are afraid to speak in front of others. Because you don't really believe it will happen. Jesus looked at them and said, let's go to the other side. They heard it. The storms regardless. So when the storms rose, no wonder they looked at him and said, care us not down that we perish. He stood up from where he was sleeping. He was not disturbed by it because he believed in what he said. Now when I say we are going to the other side, no storm will stop us from getting there. No storm will stop us from getting there. Are you listening to what I'm saying somebody? And that's the way of God. He declares the end from the beginning. When you are starting something, that is the time to start declaring how it's going to end. That's why at the beginning of the year, we declare how the year will end. And I'm going to end this year better than I came into it. Bigger than I came into it. Wiser than I came into it. Healthier than I came into it. Stronger than I came into it. This is not a year to lose your health. No, it's not. Ah, you didn't hear me. I said, it is not a year to lose your health. He keepeth my bones. None of them is broken. All my organs, they function to the perfection that God created them to function. 
and I forbid any malfunction from coming upon this body. Body, hear the word of the Lord. Leave, grow, grow strong, work strong in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Do you believe that? Those are things you need to keep saying to yourself. My ligaments, my joints, my bones, my blood streams, my eyes, my ears, all my organs. Enjoy the life of God. Enjoy wholeness. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Nothing stolen. Nothing damaged in my body in the name of Jesus shout amen if you believe it <laughs> Woo. you got to keep saying it keep talking it keep talking it you know recently I woke up one morning I was going to get out of bed and I think I probably got out you know strained my back and I had very excruciating pain on the back like that I mean, I literally was being careful whenever I needed to bend and all that. But I began to speak God's word. I said, See, joints, you're healed. Pain, go away. You know, and I told mom, I said, you know, I feel this, blah, blah, blah. I said, but I'm ready to go. Day one, she asked me, I said, how, 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 how's your back now? I said, it's getting better. Hallelujah. It's getting better. Day two, how is it now? It's getting better. Hallelujah. Right now, it's gone. <laughs> are you listening to what I'm saying because the word works the word works but every time I felt it when it was there you know it only reminded me to speak you see anytime what you are believing for appears to you as though it hasn't moved or it hasn't come maybe something you want to come or something you want to leave anytime you see that that thing is still there let it be a reminder to apply the word again don't let it be something that now makes you sink in your heart. Let it just remind you, we're going to apply the power of God's word again. So every time I felt the pain, I said, glory to God. You pain, be gone. Thank you, Jesus. And then I would deliberately try to do what I couldn't do before. <laughs> because you see, that's the way it works. You believe it. Let me put it this way. You hear it. You believe it. You say it. And you do it. I'll say that again hear it, that is you hear what the word says about that situation. You believe it, you say it, and then you do it. That is you act upon it. I've heard the word of God that healing is mine. I believe the word of God that healing is mine. And so I began to say it, you pain be gone. And then I act on it by doing what? By trying to do what I couldn't do before. So I really began to do stretches. My God. And sometimes I'm doing the stretches, I feel the pain a little, but I go ahead to do it. <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm saying? And I'm demonstrating that to you for you to understand. That is how faith works for everybody. God is not going to make a special arrangement for you that is different from faith. No, sir. You are special, but you are not that special. <laughs> you are not so special that God will make an exception for you where the law of faith is concerned. The way faith works for everybody is the way it works. it's going to work for you. If you don't work it that way, and that's the same way God will not exempt you from seeing the working of that principle of faith when you apply it. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Faith works for everyone. That's why Jesus said, whosoever, 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 and I can like to say, whosoever means you, soever. It means me, soever. <laughs> and that's how you got to speak. You got to call things, call things, because we understand by faith, by faith. It was like we kept saying over and over, over and over, over and over that the things, did you see, which be not, were made from things that do not appear. So faith can make things. Faith can summon things. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Faith makes things. Faith brings things. 
If it's a bad thing, faith can destroy bad things. Woo! Faith will create good things. I told you, faith will change the entire scenery of your life. Because when Jesus said, you said to the mountain, be our move, be our castle, you see, can a mountain leave a place and you will not notice? If the mountain was in a place before and suddenly it, it moves from where it is and it goes into the sea, the first thing that will happen is the scenery will change. Because he didn't say pebbles. He didn't say a small stone. A whole mountain. If it leaves its location, there will be a void. There will be a free space that will be noticeable. And in other words, Jesus is saying, when you begin to live by faith, you will see the scenery of your life change. That things that shouldn't be there, you can move them out. And you can bring things that should be there to come and take their place there. And he's saying that when you tell the, the mountain to be cast into the sea, a sea is the only thing, the sea is the only thing, the body of water, that is capable of swallowing a mountain and make it look like the mountain never existed. If a mountain enters a sea, you won't even notice something entered it. And if it enters the sea, it means it cannot come back again. So faith will bring permanent changes. <laughs> Whatever is done by faith is permanent. So stop being afraid. When some great things in God happens to you by faith, don't let that begin to scare that. Don't worry, that sickness is coming back. No, it's not coming back. It's like that mountain. It has been cast into the sea. It has been swallowed by the sea. It doesn't have legs. It can't walk back into my life. So I'm saying to somebody tonight, that pain is not coming back. That sickness is not coming back. You are not going back to yesterday. You will keep pressing on and on and on. Shout your loudest amen, somebody. <laughs> Woo, be seated. Glory to God. So it's the Lord. And we must keep saying it again and again and again and again. Sometimes people ask, somebody asks Nobel Ease. Nobel Ease was one of Brother Egan's contemporaries. They were very good friends. Nobelius was a teacher. I wasn't a pastor. As he was a teacher of the word, teaching ministry, businessman. And somebody asked him, and said, how many times should I confess it before I see it? <laughs> he said, one million times. Of course, it was his way of saying, till you see it. Like somebody said, he asked the spiritual father, how long should I pray before I stop on that matter? He said, how does beans get done how do you know when it is done? Until it is done. <laughs> you keep testing it. You press it. When it is very soft, then you know it is done. That's the way it is. You pray, you speak, and you keep pressing it. You press it again. You press it again. So every time you press it and it's still hard, it's a reminder, put more pressure. Speak more. Pray more. Then put more pressure. Then check it again. And before you know what is going on, it will soften up. Then you look at it again, then it will soften up. And before you know what is happening, it is done. <laughs> so this is not something we do. It's not a formula. That's why there's the law of faith and there's the spirit of faith. If you try to apply the law of faith without the spirit of faith, you will reduce it to a formula. It's not a formula. Is the force of the divine life at work. That's what it is. Faith is the force of the divine life at work. It's the force of the divine life at work. That's the first way God introduced himself to humanity. And God said, light be. And light was. The force of the divine life. Boom on the scene just like that. He spoke and boom, just like that, light. And that's the light. The light of every man that comes into the world, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because by the time Paul speaks of it, in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, he said, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. He didn't say God who commanded light. He said God who commanded the light. And Jesus came and said, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. As long as I'm in the world, John 9, 5, I am the light of the world, Jesus said. 
So when he said, God who commanded the light, he's talking about Jesus, the Son of God, to come or shine out of darkness. He said, he has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Meaning everything that is going to carry God's life is commanded. You can't use hands to make it. It must be commanded. It must be spoken. It must be spoken. That is how we came into Christ. We were brought forth by his word. Being born again, not of incorruptible seed. I'm mean, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. That is how we were born. We're not born again. We're not born by, in the spirit by putting clay and some sand together. No, sir. We were brought forth by his word. <laughs> born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. In other words, the reborn man in Christ, the new creation man, is a product of faith at work. He's a product of faith at work. He is therefore the minister to you the spirit and worketh miracles amongst you. He said he do he doeth he by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. So when the, the word of faith goes forth and a man hears the hearing of faith, that faith of God brings forth a new life inside of him because this is the victory that overcometh and that's why it is the victory that overcomes even our faith it is a world overcoming faith there is nothing it cannot overcome and I'm saying that to you tonight no matter what it is standing in front of you in your life the faith of God in you will overcome it it will overcome it it will overcome it you know when you read the book of Revelations you see that statement. Please be seated. You see the statement again and again. He said, he that overcometh, I shall give to partake of the, 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 the tree of life and, and all those things. All right? Let's even go see a few of it. Uh, Revelations 2. Revelations 2, 11. He said, he that hath and hear, let him hear. All the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh, notice now, he says, shall not be heard of the second death. It's good to understand. So who is he that overcometh? 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh but he that believeth? Did you see that? Because that is what it means. Everywhere you see he that overcometh, he that overcometh in the book of Revelation, the answer is in 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's why we hear in Revelation 2, 11, he said, that one that overcometh, he shall not taste of the second death. You know, I mentioned second death last week. All right? That is the eternal death. That is the death that no man is yet to taste of. Because Jesus, that was what Jesus meant to taste for us. Hebrews 2.9. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 2.9. Hallelujah. We see Jesus. Do you see that? Who was made a little lower than the angels. By the way, if you read the originals, it says, we see Jesus who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels. And a little while is 33 and a half years. Now was made man a little lower than the angels, meaning when you are in the mortal flesh, you are a little lower, not in ranking, but in ability. Psalm 103, 20, you remember? It says, bless the Lord, these holy angels who excel in strength. So to excel is to be above, beyond, you see? All right? So anyway, he says, so he says, go, go back to Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus. You see, he said, because if you read the previous verses, we do not, he was quoting from Psalm chapter 2, what is man, thou mindful of him, Psalm 8, rather. That has made him a little lower than angels and put all things under his feet. So, anyway, but we see Jesus, all right, doesn't work, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death. And this again just explains the incarnation, the reason for the incarnation. The reason for it is so that he could what? Die. Never forget that. That's why you see God was made flesh. He didn't say God added flesh. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know there's a statement that is that sounds correct, but it's really it has issues when you really study well that God was, I mean that Jesus is 100 percent man, 100 percent God, you know, when he was here. That's not true. Because to be 100 percent God, 100 percent man, it's more like saying he just came and added flesh to divinity. That's not what the Bible says in Philippians 2 5. Philippians 2 5 says, There is man being you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though was in the form of God, thought he not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And then he took upon the form of a servant. Became like man. Became man, not like man. You understand that? In other words, he set the divinity aside and then took on humanity. 
So he didn't say he added humanity to his divinity. If he had added humanity to his divinity, then we'll say 100% God, 100% man. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he put that aside. He put divinity aside. And he took humanity in exchange for divinity. So when he walked the face of the earth, he was a man. But we know it was God that became that man. You understand that now? Uh -huh. He was a man who... Amen? He, and that's what I told you before. He was not pretending. When he was 12 and he went to the synagogue and he was asking questions, it was not as he was trying to play tricks on them. I, you know I'm God, I know everything. So let me just test them. He said, so uh, who wrote Genesis? And I said, let me see whether they will know it. And I said, it's Zachariah. He said, hey, Olodo, 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 I priest. No. He wasn't fooling them. Every question he asked, he really asked because he wanted to know. He, see, as man in his early ministry, he was not omniscient. Whatever Jesus knew supernaturally, he was by the Holy Ghost working in him. The same way the Holy Ghost working in you now will make you know things. Are you listening to what I'm saying? That's why Jesus had to be baptized with the Spirit. That's why he couldn't even start ministry before that. Because if you say he was 100% God, then the implication is the fact that at the point where the Holy Ghost baptized him, it was just a drama. Just baptize him so that they will. So, so that if I, if, if I, it will now be like the way he went to John the Baptist and said, let us do it so that we fulfill righteousness. No, it's how he really needed the Holy Ghost. As I said, Peter rose up in the house of Cornelius and said, How God, Acts 10 38, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. You can't anoint God. You can only anoint man. God doesn't need anointing. He's already God. Anointing makes you to operate in the class of God. So if he was 100% man, I mean 100% God, then he wouldn't have needed the anointing. He needed the anointing like we needed the anointing too. But now we are also anointed like him. <laughs> so I said, he made himself of no reputation. He didn't say he made himself of small reputation. No. And if you read in the original, he said, he, he looked at divinity as something not to cling on to. He let it go. He, that's what, he really came down. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we, we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of God. Full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Are you seeing this somebody? So, back to Hebrews 2, 9. And so we understand, he tasted death. Please be seated. He tasted death. So he says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower. And like I said, for a while, that's just his heavenly ministry. And this again, this scripture helps us still see what we're talking about. That if he was made a little lower than the angels, it's because he is 100% man. You understand that? In his heavenly ministry. And then he says, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, I've told you. You see, man is born spiritually dead. All right? Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you, as he quickened, who were dead. And so, if Jesus is tasting death for us, it couldn't possibly be the death we already experienced. If I read some other translations, I think Kenneth Wish translation, Passion translation, he says that he might experience death. Put the Passion translation on screen on behalf of man. Passion. But we see Jesus who was a, who was a, who as a man, look at that again, who as a man lived for a short time lower than the angels and has now been crowned with glorious honor because of what he suffered in his death for it was by God's grace that he experienced death's bitterness on behalf of everyone. Now, if somebody did something on your behalf, it means it is something you haven't done and so that you don't have to do it. But we know that man without Christ is spiritually dead. Don't forget death is separation. And that's why you see Paul describes it in the book of Ephesians, to be alienated from the life of God. To be without God in this world. That's spiritual death. So if we already experienced spiritual death before we came into Christ, and yet Jesus went to taste some death for us, then definitely it couldn't be just the spiritual death Jesus died. Jesus died a death that man is yet to experience. That is what is called the second death. 
it is the eternal death. That one is permanent. That one, there is no return. Are you seeing this now? And that's the point there, that he had to suffer it, experience it, don't forget now, in man's behalf, so that you don't have to die that death. If I can read on, let's go to Revelation. So we'll see a few more scriptures there. In Revelation 20, and verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such, on the first, he said the first resurrection. Now, we are not looking at the book of Revelation, but you understand, we've been raised together with the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand that? We've been quickened together with him. Hallelujah. Okay, that's the main resurrection that has happened. The next, the second, why is he talking about first resurrection? There's a second resurrection. That's the resurrection of what now? Our bodies. Are you listening somebody? The first resurrection is what makes the second resurrection possible. If, you, if the spirit of he that raised Christ from the dead is not in you, and that is he has quickened you, that is the real you, which is a spirit. If it is not there, then your body cannot be quickened. Is that okay? Are you getting that somebody? I'm just quoting Romans 8, 11. That's what I just said now. If the spirit of he that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also what? Quicken your mortal bodies. It's the same thing Paul spoke about in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 2 and 3. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. The word building is the Greek word or economy. All right? The building of God and house, not made with hands. Wait. The house there is the Greek word oikia. Is family. A family. Glory to God. No, it's a, a house not made with hands. A family that is not a natural family. Are you seeing this now? He says, eternal in the heavens. Verse 2. For in this we groan. And you're going to see the same word groan when you go to Romans 8. I, I, I shared this with the leaders recently. I'm not sure which you tonight do, but all right. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That is the same groaning in Romans 8. All right, from verse 23. That the groaning that we are groaning together with nature. And that word groaning means a sigh. Do you see what I'm saying now? A sigh. Can you see that? Because when you look at the limitations of the unregenerate body. And that is the same body your regenerated spirit lives inside. It's a limitation. Are you seeing this? So he says, and not only they, go, come on, go back, don't worry, go back to, go back to 2 Corinthians 5. Hallelujah. For in this we groan earnestly designed to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Hold it there. You see Philippians 3.20. It says our conversation or citizenship is not from this world but from heaven above from whence we expect a savior who will also change our vile bodies to be fashioned like unto his own glorious body. So what you see, it's the same Paul that is saying all these things. So he says, in this we grow in energy designed to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. And this is still what is called rapture. Do you hear what I'm saying now? We'll be clothed upon. So it's not as if Jesus is really bringing a new body. What is going to happen is just that this body will be changed. Are you getting what we're saying? All right, so... And then he says in verse 3, come on, come on, verse 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found, what? Naked. In other words, we shall not be found without the glorious body. Is that okay? Are you getting it? All right, so go back to Revelations. And in chapter, the same chapter 20, verse 14, he says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And then he says, this is the second Death. Are you getting it? Glory to God. You see that? So he's talking about that order death, as it were. Amen. And that is what those who, like he said, he that overcometh will not taste of that one. And we have seen who is he that overcometh. Is he that believeth that Jesus is the what? The Son of God. That's me. 
So now he that overcometh is not he that overcometh all the hardship of life. He that overcometh all the challenges of life. He that overcometh the temptation to leave Jesus. He that overcometh the temptation to backslide. He that overcometh the temptation not to give tight. He that overcometh the temptation not to look at woman. He that overcometh the temptation not to look at man. Ah, he shall eat of the evil man a hero. You see, the Bible defines things by itself. Go back to 1 John 5, 5. Who is it? And I like the way John said, John asked the question, said, who is it that overcome it? Then he answered it. So we don't need you to try to answer it. Don't attempt this question in the exam. He said, who is he that overcome the world? But he that will. You know, because the previous verse, he had said, whatsoever is born of God, overcome the world. And this is a victory that overcome it, even our faith. Then he went on to say, but who is now he that overcome it? He said, it is the one who has believed that Jesus is the Son of God. Because truly, the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God is the one that has become born of God. And he has overcome. Hallelujah. And one of the things he has overcome is he has overcome death. In fact, Jesus said it in no ambiguous terms. He said, he that believeth in me shall never die. Go to John 11. Come on. John 11. John 11. John 11. Come on. Is this blessing you tonight? Give me three hallelujahs. Come on. <laughs> Woo. So John 11, 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believed in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? <laughs> Jesus is saying to, to Mary, do you believe it? Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Do you believe what I'm telling you? And you want to say, but, but even this person that he's talking to, she died now, but she will never die. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but she will never die. Are you getting this? She'll never die. The way you will know whether you will never die eternally is here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It is decided here oh, yes. Oh, yes. by believing in Jesus. Oh, You know, we're coming to church. My daughter asked a very, very powerful question. Out of the blues. She said, Daddy, if somebody believes in Jesus, but they continue to sin, and they're just sin and sin, and they die like that, would they make heaven? Would they go to heaven? Or would they go to hell? I said, wow, that's a beautiful question. So, before I could answer, David said, Daddy, I want to answer a question. I said, go ahead. And he said, it is not what a person is doing that determines whether he goes to heaven. It is by believing in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I said, wow. I said, that's a powerful answer. I said, so you gave a very good answer. I said, so, but let me now answer like a teacher. I said, the, the, the main answer there is that he that has believed in Jesus will not continue to live in sin. He will not. Person 3, 7. Open it. Person 3, 7. And I like the way John was very, very clear. Don't be deceived, little children. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous. And then in the next verse 8, he says, And for this, he that committed sin is of the devil. He says, For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So we see that sin is really the works of the devil. That's why those who are of him will continue to sin. Because it is his works. But when we receive the life of God, we have entered into victory over sin. That's why in Romans 6, 14, it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Because you are not under the law. You are now under the grace of God. Don't forget, it was by that grace Jesus tasted death for us. Ay, 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 ay. So he set me free from death. Set me free from sin. Now I'm a child of God. The things I used to do, I do them no more. I'm now a redeemed man. Do you remember Titus 2, 14? Who gave himself for us, that he might deliver us from all iniquity. I'm purified to himself. A peculiar people. Zealous of good works. So there is now a new zeal. A new desire. You know, I said to our kids, I said, it's just like a fish that was made a dog. 
It can no longer love to be in water. Yeah. It's not possible. Then nature has changed. Dogs don't enjoy staying inside water. So if a fish has been converted to a dog, it is a complete change of nature. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it cannot enjoy what it used to enjoy again. It's not possible. It's not possible. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying tonight? Somebody say, I'm a new man. Say, I'm born again. I'm a new creature. God lives in me. I have the life of God in me right now. Oh, hallelujah. I have the spirit of the living God. The spirit of the son of God. What has happened must be confessed so that it can be an experience. You keep saying it. The woman healed from the issue of blood. She had heard about Jesus. <laughs> she heard about Jesus. But she didn't just hear about Jesus. She believed what she heard. And she didn't stop at believing. Otherwise she would have died in her sickness. She began to say something. What she said is the reason she experienced what she heard. Ayabaka. She heard that Jesus is healing people. What brought her to experience the healing of Jesus is that she said it. And then she acted on it. He, people are touching his garment. And because I showed you, he, that was not the first, the, Jesus, that happened to Jesus about two times. Crowd came, touched his clothes. So she heard. That lets us know what she heard. Because it was what she heard that she said. And it was what she said that she did. So she must have heard of the other instances where multitude came. No wonder she came where there was a multitude as well. She probably just felt in her heart that, well, since there is a multitude, maybe they've also all come to touch him. But on this particular day, all of them didn't come to touch to be healed. But well, she, she came to touch him and be healed because that's what she heard. And as this what I've told you, faith is personal. Yes, yes, don't leave your house with expectation. Then you come to church because you don't see other people with expectation. You now pack up your expectation. No, that's your own. Carry your own expectation. It doesn't matter whether the person sitting to your left or your right has expectation. It's not your concern. Hold your own expectation. Be like that woman. Because the rest of the people, I'm sure she must have been surprised when she got to that place that day. <laughs> These people, it doesn't look like they are trying to touch him to receive him, you know. But it didn't move her at all. What she heard was strong enough in her heart. And I know that if I touch, but it's close, I shall be made whole. So she began to make her way. In the midst of the crowd. It's like simply saying, look, all of you that you are just here looking like this, give way, give way. Make way, make way. I will get to him. I only need one touch. Just one. Just, and just one was enough. You see, the reason why one touch was enough is because she had been saying it. 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 So if you don't say it, you can believe it in your heart, but you won't experience it. You're not going to express it just because you believe it. No. It's when you say it. It's when you say it. That's why you see, when hands are laid on you for healing, receive the healing, but open your mouth to declare it. I thank you, Father, because right now I receive my healing. In the name of Jesus. Brother Hagin prayed for a woman. She was on the wheelchair. Her children used to bring her for the meetings. And then Brother Hagin told her, he said, I will be lying to you and I will be doing great disservice if I don't tell you the truth. But right now I feel the anointing has lifted. Ah, and he's looking at this woman, she, I mean, she wants to walk again. And Brother Higgins said, he looked at her and he said, but we can trust God's word. And he began to read some scriptures to her. And read them to her about faith and healing. Faith and healing. Until by herself, she got the point. Because he was saying, I read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Before God, whom we believe, you the God that quickened any death and called the things that be not as though they were. And she read, and at the point, she said, yeah, I see it. And she lifted up her hands and began to say, thank you, Father. Because the days when they, my children needed to carry me in a wheelchair, those days are gone. Now I see myself walking. Thank you, because right now, I'm healed. I can walk. And she, as she was saying it, she got up out of the wheelchair. And she began to walk by herself. She just saw something in God's word. And she began to say that thing. And say that thing. And right there and then, what the special anointing would have done, her simple faith got in it. When she began to 
say it. Because she had seen it. Are you getting this somebody tonight? You see, sometimes that's what happens because you see in, in Job 22, he says, Thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee, and light shall shine upon your path. In other words, if you are not even speaking, you don't stand the chance for light to shine on your path. Your speaking will bring light. As you are saying it, light will strike you at some point. Ah, wow. That's I told you, there is a speaking that is meditation. Because that's the, that's the, you are schooling your heart. You are saying it. Just get to your room, pace the floor in your house. You are just pacing the floor like that. And you are saying all the words it is. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. You know, anytime you have a difficult situation, please be seated. You have a difficult situation at hand. But if you have that kind of situation where you pray, 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 it's as if you've not seen anything change. Go and gather scriptures concerning that area of your life. And then begin to meditate on them. And don't forget, meditation means you're just speaking and muttering to yourself. It's from the Hebrew word agar. You're muttering words to yourself. And you're thinking of those words. No, meditation is not speaking and your mind is somewhere else. If your mind is somewhere else and not meditating, that one, you are soliloquizing. Alright? Meditation is that as you are speaking quietly, muttering to yourself, it's like, in fact, many will probably be able to relate easily or easier with this. It's like murmuring. How many of you used to murmur? They say, well, when you were younger, they say, go and wash the plate in the kitchen. Mm, somebody will now be going and wash the plate again. Do you know that as you were saying, somebody will go and be, are you actually going to us washing the plate? When you go there, wash. That's the way you need to be to murmur. Somebody's not going to begin to prosper now. It's not going to begin to have car. <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting it now? <laughs> that is actually what is called meditation. That as you were saying it, you were thinking on what you were saying. And you continue to think on it and keep saying it. And once that happens, you will bring forth something of God over that matter. There is nothing so hard that meditation of the word of God will not crack it. Are you getting what I'm saying? And when you get to that place of meditation where there is a light and one scripture stands in your spirit or a word from the Lord stands in your spirit, hold that word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You hold that word. No matter what you see, use that word to slam anything you see. So you get into meditation to, it's like you are, you are in meditation to bring one word, to receive something that you are going to hold on to. This is the labor of the believer where faith is concerned. Please be seated. This is where our labor is as believers. This is where our labor is. Because he works all the time. <laughs> Woo! Some of you I know you need to get to a man and sit with Psalm 23. And you begin to that's it where more money to yourself. The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. But it's just that the difference is that you know when the person is more he's sad. Somebody will not go and be watching clip. Oh, yeah, you know, yes, there is joy with this one. Yes. So whatsoever I do, my hand, my hands, whatever I lay my hands upon, shall prosper. Yes, the word says it's going to prosper. Yes, it's going to prosper. I'm going to go for that interview. They will call me. When they see me, they will like me. Every one of them. Thank you, Jesus. Because the Lord says in his word, Thou God will bless the righteous with favor. You encompass me as with a shield. Oh, I'm shielded with favor. I'm shielded with favor. A magnetic force of favor is upon me. You know, you know, and as, you know the thing there is that as you are saying it and you are thinking on it, your thoughts will break into manifestation of what you are saying. Like you now start seeing yourself play out those words. You see those words playing out in your life. And as you meditate, usually interjecting with tongues. You know, sometimes you, when you are praying in the spirit, one of the things you will do in, in, your, in your prayer life is this. Always ensure that whenever you are praying in tongues, do your best to bring your mind to be quiet. Now, to quiet your mind is not like you are trying to say, shut up, shut up. To quiet your mind simply means bring your mind to where you are praying and to your prayer. That's all. You see, 
These are some very simple secrets of how to have a daily walk with the Lord. In meditation, in praying in the Spirit. Just as you're praying, it's bring your mind to your prayer. When it tries to go into something, destroy, bring it back. That is, cancel those thoughts and bring your mind back. You know, sometimes it can take you the first 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes of your prayer. That's why the more intimate you are with God, the faster your mind can settle in prayer. You get to a point where the more you start praying like this, your mind settles. Now, sometimes situations arise that usually wants to begin to disturb your mind, but if your intimacy with God is very strong, you would have developed the capacity to quiet your mind on time, no matter what the circumstances are. Usually some situations arise that trouble you, you're trying to pray, but your mind is just going into the situation, going into the situation. But with practice, you will master how, even in those kind of situations, to still quiet that mind and bring it to the place of prayer. Because a mind that wanders from prayer will render prayer ineffective. Because when the answers and the responses from God in prayer comes, it is your understanding that will pick it. Your spirit will pick it, but it must come into your understanding. Alright? Your spirit picks the answer, but for you to know the answer, your understanding must comprehend it. And that understanding is that mind. So if it is wandering around, it will not be able to receive the understanding the Holy Ghost is bringing through your spirit. So distraction is not a good thing in prayer. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And as I keep saying to you, if you practice and as you continue to practice in your fellowship with God, you realize that it won't take too long to get answers to prayer. What prolongs it most times is that distracted mind. It is just all over the place. You see, as for your spirit and the Holy Ghost, they are not far from each other. They are one. So the Holy Ghost can tell you something immediately now. Why do you not know it yet? Your mind is all over the place. If you bring that mind to its place, which is supposed to be under your spirit, anything your spirit is like this, you just drop it into your mind like a bucket. Oh yeah? Your bucket also, yeah? Bruce, where? And that's why when you can do that, you realize there's peace. That's, if I, that is a very simple, practical explanation on how to hear God on any matter. Quiet the mind. In prayer, in meditation, quiet the mind. Let the mind stay. When you're meditating, bring your mind to that meditation. Bring your mind to that word, you're saying. And I can tell you, because when, as you're speaking the word, muttering it in meditation, in fact, it is one of the most effective ways to focus your mind. Just speaking, speaking. That's why you say all those Western meditation, Eastern meditation, they are trying to pervert the real meditation from God's word. So they will say, quiet. Mm. Or you see the Western meditation, they are trying to say things, say this, say this. They are trying to focus their minds, focus their minds. It's a perversion of the right thing, of a holy thing. God said to Joshua, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth. You don't understand? God had to admonish him with those instructions. You are stepping into the shoes of Moses. Ah, how do you want to do it? <laughs> how do you want to do it? Do you know this God was not really giving Joshua any new revelation? He said, just as I said to my servant Moses, as I was with my servant Moses, Moses was his reference. You know what I'm saying? He was a big, he was, there were big shoes to step into. And God was telling me, everything I commanded my servant Moses, just stay with it. Meditate on it. You know, that was what made Moses Moses is in those things I said to him. Hiya. If you too can lay hold of those things, you will see great manifestations in your life. Because the power of God is not in his mouth, it's in his word. So once he gives you his word and you can lay hold on his word, you will see the manifestations of God. So meditate on it day and night. Then he said that thou mayest observe who to do. Ha, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because at that point, when you start meditating, your mind has only one focus at that point. What you are meditating on. What you are saying. Your mind will begin to see it. To begin to see it. To begin to see it. You are taking the city. So mightily grow the world. And it prevails. The Lord is multiplying us. And it makes us tens of thousands. You know, and you're meditating on it. And you're meditating on it. And before you know what is going on, everywhere, when people, you know what I'm saying? That's how it works. God shouldn't give you word and you're not meditating on what he said. 
He said to Joshua, that's the secret of good success. Anything I have told you, go and be meditating on it. Some of you, you need to go home now and bring out your notes where you wrote down your prophetic words that you received from God. You don't jot prophecy so that you can leave it in your notes. You jot it so that you can accurately meditate. So that it, you are meditating on the accurate word as you received. But don't leave it on the pages of your book. It's not going to work on the pages. It will work from there. It's going to work from your mouth. What did God tell you about this year? What did God tell you about your marriage? What did God tell you about your health? What did God tell you about that situation? Take it now and start meditating. And begin to say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Usually meditation eventually becomes loud proclamations. Because like I told you, as you're meditating, some specific word will stand out. That one, when you take it, there's no need to meditate on that one again. That one is your sword. You'll be fighting with it. You'll be wielding it. That one, you can shout it on the rooftop. If I by then, they only need to tell you to shout. You will shout. Nobody will tell you. Because anything that comes out of meditation, it will become a shout. <laughs> That's the one you will shout and say, I've got it. That's the way Bishop David Oedipo shouted and said, I can never be poor. <laughs> You know how many people are saying it and still broke? Because it didn't come from their spirit. It came from his own spirit. In an encounter, meditation on the world, that thing stood out. I can never be poor. It is from meditation. I can never be stranded. <laughs> it's from meditation. No. I can never be stranded. It's not possible. It's not possible. Anything that comes from meditation, you are convinced. The devil can't shake it off you again. No. Because it's no longer what you, somebody told you. It has entered your spirit. Are you still here somewhere? Oh, we see that, we see that, we see that. Everywhere you are tonight, in the Oshobo Church, Baton Church, Christ, Tribe, everybody online, glory to God. The same spirit of faith is saturating this place and everywhere. You know, when the spirit of faith moves on a congregation, it strengthens people in faith. And God is doing that tonight. Oh, God is strengthening you in faith. Tonight. You are being strengthened in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Just take a seat, take a seat. Glory to Jesus. All right, and we've said four things. You know, we're not getting into the message. Everything I've been doing is introduction. <laughs> but it's part of the message. But there are four areas your confession should cover. And by that, I simply mean these four areas are what undergirds faith declarations. The first one is what happened from the cross to the throne. The first of the four areas is what happened from the cross to the throne. And by that, we're talking about the redemptive work of Christ in the price he paid for our forgiveness and then for our justification. And then consequently, our, our justification. And so what happened from the cross to the throne? The cross is a place where Jesus suffered. Where he suffered for our sins. He was crucified, as you know. And you look at scriptures on this. Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 5. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. They didn't do all this to him during his earthly ministry. They did this to him after they had, they had captured him. Do you see this? And then he says, He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Go to Psalms and chapter 22. Psalms and chapter 22. You know, these facts as they dawn on your spirit, they strengthen you in faith. Because faith is not something we try. Faith is proven. It has worked. Psalms 22 from verse 12 to 21. Many bulls. Now, this is what one of the Psalms of David, all right? And then he says from verse 12, Many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. 
My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up. These are descriptions, prophetic descriptions of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot share. And my tongue cleaved to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of the earth. This is a description of how the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and buried. For dogs have compassed me. Now the dogs, this is proverbial. The dogs here are the Pharisees. You know, Paul speaking to the Philippians, Philippians, he said, beware of dogs. Beware of the circumcision. You see now. And they were the ones who took the Lord Jesus Christ to crucify him. So he went on, he said, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Does that show you a clear picture of the Lord Jesus now? You see, he said, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Can you remember the story of crucifixion? Did they cast lots with Jesus' clothes or not? But David spoke of this over a thousand years ahead of time. And again, every time you read these Psalms of David, they are called Messianic Psalms because they talk about Lord Jesus Christ. It shows you how intimate God can get with a man. And how intimate God wants to get with man. And that God loves to share his secrets with those who are meek and those who give time to him, to spend time with him. How God can show a man thousands of years ahead what he's going to do. I told you on Sunday, I, whether in the first or second service, when you read about prophet Isaiah, see, he died with a label of false prophet. People called him a false prophet because the prophecies of Isaiah were prophecies that never happened in his time. That is his messianic prophecies. He prophesied on, he said, a virgin, the Lord shall show you a sign, Isaiah 7, 14. A, the Lord shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. It never happened in his day. It happened 700 years later. So many looked at him and said, you this holy okay? false prophet. He said, a virgin shall conceive. Where the virgin? Every virgin we know here, they, they married, they had sex before they had children. You now say, a virgin shall conceive and have a child. He shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall call. And you know, by the way, Isaiah had a son called Emmanuel. So perhaps when his wife gave birth and the name Emmanuel, he said, Is this your Emmanuel? <laughs> I'm sure even that Emmanuel must have lived all his life being called the son of a false prophet. Are you seeing this, somebody? But did you know, he prophesied again. And again, and again, and again, and again. He won't stop talking about Jesus. Even before those things happen. How come you and I, that are living in a time when it has already happened, how come you have stopped talking? You can't stop talking. You've got to preach. You've got to tell the unsaved about Jesus. See how much some people went through to foretell of it. We have now been called to foretell. They risk their lives to prophesy something that never God fulfilled in their day. You imagine a prophecy that happened 700 years later. He was not even alive to see it. Meaning he was not alive to be vindicated. That alas, she where I said it. She be very good to you. I mean, Isaiah never saw it happen. But I know one thing about men like that. He saw it in the spirit and that was enough for him. That was enough for him. Just like Jesus said about Father Abraham, John 8, 56, Abraham, your father rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. You should be glad and content when God has shown you in your spirit, even before you see it in the physical. You should be. Now, I'm not saying you should not expect physical manifestation. But you see, your real joy should not come after it has manifested physically. Be glad like Abraham just by seeing it in the spirit. <laughs> That's why in Hebrews 11, the Bible says, 
they saw that city afar off and they saluted it. And that was saluted means they greeted it with joy. They embraced it. To them, it was as good as done. Oh, my God. Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. It was so real to those men that Joseph in his old days said to his brethren, don't bury me in Egypt. Carry my bones. I know God will take you to that land. I know he will take you there. Can you imagine? They died believing it. Hiya. Can you imagine that? So faith is not, see, all this faith that is still dependent on uh, uh, the one God did before. That's why you are believing the one is telling you now. You are not a serious one. If God has no reference, believe still. Believe still. God has more than enough record and credit. Do you see? For you to still subject him to be saying, God, show me proof before I believe. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Can you pat water in your bathtub? This God parted the Red Sea. Three million people walked through it. The Red Sea stayed. It congealed by the sides. And there was dry ground. It was not in a hurry to close up on them. He waited for three million people. Young and old. They all passed through. Do you know what it means for three million people to be trekking? <laughs> so, that, so that they will know this is no fluke. This is no coincidence that God is saying, I did it. The Red Sea parted, rose on both sides and stayed there. Imagine the way they all felt walking through the Red Sea and looking at that water to the left and to the right. I said, can you imagine? Ah, yeah. Here is a woman who touch it and even drink. <laughs> if they want to, let's taste it. Ah, yeah. They can even bathe and say, ah, I never bathed since yesterday. They make a bath small. You don't look at them and say, you don't bath. Who you help? Oh, you're baffled. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like God looking at that, that beer that close. Because that is how you know. Because he says in Hebrews, he says he upholds all things, Hebrews 1 3, by the word of his power. You wake up in the morning, you see the sun in his place. It's a reminder to you the word is working. The word is still working. The word is working. It's working, oh. <laughs> God has too much records. The track record of God is too strong. For you to now say, prove it to me. Prove it to me. The proofs are too much around you. He raised Jesus from the dead. What other proof do you want? <laughs> a promise he made from generations to generations. He said the same promise to Abraham. I will raise up your seed. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was what Abraham saw. He saw the resurrection. From Abraham's time, God has been telling them about resurrection. From generation, they all saw it ahead and they were glad. They were glad. By the time God will fulfill, you know, can you imagine? It would have been easy to not fulfill the promise since all the people you said it to have died. But not our God. You say, what I said I will do. Wow. Ah, yeah. As Peter was preaching in Acts 3, he said, The promise he made to our fathers, he had fulfilled them to us, their children. Tell me, whatever good things you are seeing in God now, you think that's the end to it? Wait until you have children's children's children. That they will be enjoying things, eh? And that's the reason why we will live long. Yeah. That, you know, if Jesus starts in his coming, in old days, some of us with gray hair, but strong, glory yeah. to God. Because, you see, you can be old and not stricken in years. Yeah. That with, with gray hair, without walking stick, standing on my two feet, and you see, you see, you see, you see, you see great grandpa, great grandpa. I don't even know anybody there. And they just gave me the contract. One billion dollars. They didn't even let me talk. I said, that was what God said to us. He did it for us. He did it for David. He's doing it for our grandchildren. He's doing it for our great grandchildren. And that's what he was saying to Abraham. He said, my blessings will come upon you and they will overtake you. Don't be thinking of traffic when you overtake. Overtake means they will outlive you. Your children's children will see it. 
That is how faithful God is. And he will keep his word to you. And when you've lived out your full length of days and gone to your grave in full ripe old age, like as the shock of corn comes in in his season, then God looks at your next generation and says, I'm continuing what I told your dad. And children will just be praying one morning and the Holy Ghost will be telling them, uh, there are some dimensions of prosperity I want to bring to your life now. He says, I have not done anything. I didn't so. He says, who's, who's talking to you about it? No, I told your grandfather. And I did it to your father. And you are next. <laughs> and you see, you need to be wise. Both biologically and spiritually. I've, I've, I've taught some things in ministry that even me I know is not my prayer that brought this one to me. This is a blessing of a father. Oh yeah. Sometimes even biological. I know that this one, eh? Some of you, your children will carry anointings that even though they will know that, ah, oh God, don't be my first thing, bring this anointing. Up. But God is looking and saying, look, I, I work with your father. He was an usher. He served me well. And I'm going to raise a priest in his house. Karamakatelia. You know, my, my dad is, I mean, my dad was just an elder in gospel faith mission. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. That's all we need to realize it though. You don't have to. See, God looks at the faithfulness of people. But that was just a minister, but very committed. He was a, what the example of what we call a bidextrous believer. Very high level professional, but so devoted. Teach Bible school, go to church, do everything but as a as a government official. When he was in private sector, rose to mo, in mobile oil. He got, and yet he see the commitment and everything. God can't bypass that kind of man's family. He can't. He can't. And so let me say to you, as you are serving Jesus, he's visiting your house. He's putting his hands on your children. I'm telling you, he's putting his hands on your children. <laughs> You see, some of you know, they will carry an anointing in their generation that people, their generation will marvel and say, what kind of species are these ones? Oh, and then they will know these are the seed of the righteous. And therefore, they are mighty on the earth. They are mighty on the earth. Ah, yeah, they are mighty on the earth. Hey, they are mighty on the earth. Some of your parents, they serve God, serve God. They gave everything to serve Jesus. And that's what you can't understand, you can't explain. Your love for God, even you, is like copied assignment. You can't explain it. That why do I love God like this? What is, ah, ah, where did they give me shop where they like church, like God like this? Ah, it's, the, it's certain things that God told your parents, some of you. I'm telling you. Some of that God, even some of you, your parents, the your parents that you told, they forgot it. They are even trying to stop you from serving Jesus. They forgotten how that God told them and said, this thing, the way you are doing, I will, I will put my hand on one of your children. Because some of you know, it's not because anybody is motivating you. There is, there is a fire inside you. There is a passion. There is a love for Jesus inside of you. I know what I'm saying. Because that's what came upon me too as a little boy. That love, that passion, and it's still there. It keeps burning stronger. I are wondering, what did I do, God? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. So imagine a God that can keep his promise to a thousand generations. Will he not keep his word to you in your present day life? I have no reason to doubt God. I have no reason to doubt him. Let what he's saying to you matter to you. Let the word of God matter to you. Let it matter to you than your circumstances. Because those your circumstances, they are just, they are just making mouth. <laughs> That's why you must make mouth too. But your own mouth is bigger than the mouth of your circumstances. It will shut down the mouth of your circumstances. It was, I will make my boast in the Lord. Say, so the humble shall hear it and be glad. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. To boast in God is to say what God said. That's how to boast in God. Lord, I boast in you. I boast in you. And then I begin to say what he said. That's what, what it means to boast in you. And you are saying what God said. You are saying it with the confidence. Ah, he said, why are you getting dressed? God told me the job is mine. That's why. 
That's why. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Somebody needs to begin to get ready for what God has told you. <laughs> yes. You need to begin to get ready for what God told you. You need to get ready. Now people look at you and say, why are you doing what you're doing? They say, because God said it. That's why. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because God said it. That's the reason why. That's the reason why. <laughs> That's the reason why. That's the reason why. Kaya Rabaya Talabaya. Enderegoba Shekelea. I mean, after all, you trust human being and machine. They check you. They say your EDD is so so dead. A human being, based on the machine that he used to test you. And because he said this is your EDD, you started buying things. You started getting ready. That the baby can come and say that. Ordinary human being told you that one. When God tells you your EDD, EDD for that breakthrough, EDD for that house, EDD for that job, EDD, EDD from God. Take it serious. Act upon it. Stop preparing. Pull out your ten pegs. Straight from the curtains of your habitation. Because you are about to break forth to the right and break forth to the left. God is bringing enlargement to your life. Aya. <laughs> I say, you believe man. How can you not believe God? How dare you not believe God, actually? <laughs> How dare you not believe God? I mean, it's not as if you open your wife's stomach to, to be sure that this baby is, this pregnancy is now 39 weeks. This machine they used to test everything. And, and you began to act accordingly. <laughs> Man said something and you're acting on it. Which is fine. Though. But you should act better even with God. When he says, hey, enlarge the place of your dwelling. That's what I like. God, God is going to tell you to do something that looks crazy as preparation for what he's bringing. Say, enlarge. Enlarge the place of your dream. You see the way he like that said to him? He said, oh God, start running. You know? If you don't run, oh, the rain will go beat you. Eh? Ah, they're not going to say you be king. Start running now. Ah, the God say what? He said, I'm hearing a sound. Of abundance of rain. You can imagine a saying, but me, I can't hear this. Oh, God, nobody here that they hear this one. Now my ear that they hear that. <laughs> Say, start running now. So that's what God is saying to start, start enlarging, start making room. He said, You will not see the wind, you will not see the cloud, but this valley, it shall be filled with water. <laughs> He said, where would, the, where would the water that come from? God said, shall that be? I said, shall get? I said, water. Everywhere we flood them with water. The dry ground will be flooded. That wilderness is going to become a fruitful field. It's going to become a fruitful field. God is doing something in your life. The ears of those who hear it will tingle. It will look like a lie. In fact, the only reason why they will know it's not a lie is because they are seeing it. Some of you, they will look at it and say, Ah, I will never have a loser. I will never have a breakthrough. Ha 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 <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> even Satan will be shocked. <laughs> even Satan will be shocked because where he thought it was over for you, just like they thought it was over for Jesus when he was buried and he was in the grave, and then the Holy Ghost walked into the grave. Because it is the spirit of he that raised up Christ from the dead. It's the Holy Ghost that did it. And then the Holy Ghost quickened him. Quickened him. Brought him back to life. And he came out victorious. He didn't come out limping. Yes. He came out victorious. 
He took the keys of hell, took the keys of death, overcame the grave and mastered death in all its phases. I say, Holy Ghost is inside you now. It's inside you now. That same Holy Ghost is the one called the spirit of faith. Oh, yes. It's not another spirit. It's the same Holy Ghost. It's the one called the spirit of faith. You already have everything it takes to believe God. Everything. You don't need anything to add to yourself in order to believe God. You already have everything it takes to believe God. And that is your reborn spirit. Your reborn spirit came with a capacity to believe God. At all times. Especially when it looks like it doesn't make sense to believe. I repeat it again. Your reborn spirit was created by God with a capacity to believe God. Even when it doesn't make sense to believe. Even when it doesn't make sense to believe. The reborn spirit was created with the capacity to believe God. Even when it doesn't make sense. To believe him. You know some people, they believe because they have a reason to believe. That's not the faith of God. The Bible says, Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope, that he would be a father of many nations. His body stricken with years, Sarah's womb dead, meaning there was no reason to believe. But the man believed. The man still believed. It's a divine capacity. So, and it's not something you are looking for. It's what they call in today's balance is a follow come. Are you hear what I'm saying? That is a follow come. Your spirit came with it at salvation. It came with your spirit at salvation. The capacity to believe God came with your reborn spirit. Is there? Is there? Is there? Oh yeah, is there? You know, sometimes the way you use a battery that is fully charged to jumpstart a dead battery, to kickstart a car, that's the way. By the anointing, the teaching anointing, and more importantly, by the spirit of faith I carry. The Lord is jump-starting your faith. Amen. <laughs> That's what is happening to you tonight. The Lord is jump-starting your faith. He's jump-starting it. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Kari alise ke mom. Oh yes. Hey, now man, talu. <laughs> so there are places God will ask you to go. Even you, you will know that. Ah, man, if not for faith in God, what do you make me try this kind of thing? But it's time to start making those kind of moves. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> hey, sorry, Kesanta. <laughs> it's time to start making those kind of moves. It's time. It's time. Oh yes, it's time. God wants to take you places you have never been before. And God wants to give you some things that you have never had before. And God wants to do through you some things you have never done before. That's the word of the Lord to some of you today. He wants to take you places you have never been before. He wants to give you things you have never had before in your life. And he wants to do through you things you have never done before. That's what is about to happen. But your faith is stirred up tonight. It's stirred up tonight. And let me tell you, if Jesus rose again your faith will walk yes, yes. Yes. yes because what happened from that cross to the throne <laughs> hey you see all those things 
He was saying, cast lots with his clothes and over all those things. You would have thought, ah, if this kind of thing happened to anybody, there's no, how can he come out of it? Not only did Jesus know ahead that those things will happen to him, he knew something more than that. He knew he would come out of those things. I mean, how can you know that that's the kind of thing that will happen to you? And yet you went through it with a confidence that I will come out. There was an assurance Jesus gave us. And not the assurance that he's not saying it in his mind. So that I will not go and trigger them to start doing it to me now. He said it from day one of his earthly ministry till the last three and a half years. We don't know of how many of it, how much of it he said before those three years of his ministry. But at least recorded in his ministry, he kept saying it from time to time. Put down this temple. In three days, I will raise it up again. With boldness. Except a corn of wheat falls to the earth and dies. It abided alone. Ha! Ah, and he's saying it again and again. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He wasn't preaching. He was declaring the word. Those are not things he said to the, con the multitude. It was with his closest allies. There are people that can verify it. <laughs> That's why he was angry with them when he rose from the dead. You see, because unbelief annoys people. Annoys people of faith. If you're a man of faith, unbelief can upset you. So when he rose from the dead and they did still believe that, yeah, and he said, oh fools, oh slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken, meaning that is the way he himself knew. He had to read the prophets. The same way you two are reading the Bible and getting scriptures that cover your case. That's the same thing Jesus had to do. You two, you do it. And when you see it there, be bold like Jesus to say, except the corn of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it abides alone. Pull down this temple in three days. It, I will raise it up again. So you two, you can stand like Jesus and say, every time I apply and I put my hands to the work, it will prosper. I will break through in every deal. When I go out, I will come back. <laughs> That's the confidence. That's why when he stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, he was not checking whether Papa will walk. He said, Father, I thank you because you have heard me. And I know you always hear me. Uh -uh. <laughs> Remove the stone. Lazarus, come forth. And he didn't whisper it. He said it with a loud voice. Hey. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Say, come forth. As he that was dead for four days came out. Came out. You know, some Bible theologians say, Jesus had to mention the name. Because if he had just said come forth, every dead body. Come forth. So he had to be specific. We came for Lazarus. Come out from amongst that place of the dead. And he that was dead for four days. So you have to say, say, the one that was dead for four days. It's like in the realm of the dead, they were saying, e one <laughs> Which of them are you addressing? Lazarus. The one that was dead for four days is the one I'm talking to. Come out. So if peradventure there was one that was there for just four hours, they'll say, I'm not interested in that one. They didn't release faith for that one for me. Yeah. It's the one that they asked me about. So you, Lazarus, come out. Come out. He didn't say it two times, though. Once. You know why I had to say it only once and not twice? When he stood there, he said, I know you have heard me. Just like Abraham, before the God who quickened the dead, and call it the things that be not. Absolutely. So it, it's not about, uh, I'm not going to begin to pray and petition the Father to see whether I will be interested in dealing with this case. No, before I open my mouth, I already know the will of God. That's why we tell you, faith begins where the will of God is known. And as you know that will of God, hold on to it like a dog holds on, holds on to a bone. Don't let go. No matter any contrary thing you have seen or heard or you feel, don't let go. Be stubborn with the word. 
And Brother Eggie used to say, say, even if you put a baseball bat to my head, I cannot doubt this thing that, that I'm saying. So you put a gun and a trigger to my head, I will not doubt it. I'm that sure of it. They tried to shake it off, Peter and John. They said, you to consider it, whether it is good to obey God or to obey man. He said, we cannot but speak of the things that we have seen. <laughs> you cannot speak of these things. You cannot speak of these things. You cannot speak of these things. The evidence is too heavy <laughs> for you not to live by faith. It's too heavy. And even our Lord, his resurrection was by faith. He said, my, therefore my soul shall rest in hope. He said, because thou will not suffer your holy one to see corruption. You will not leave my soul in high yagana. You will not leave my soul in hell. You don't understand what? It's a, it's a high level of trust to die expecting God by his spirit to raise him back to life. What if he fails? It means he's gone for eternity. But he said, my soul will rest in hope. In other words, I have abandoned myself to you completely. Knowing you can never lie. You can never fail. If Jesus can trust himself to the hands of the Father in death, ah, uh ah, -uh, you are traveling just from here to Ibadan. Ah, uh ah, -uh, ah, uh ah, -uh, just on the house rent. Ah, uh ah, -uh. ah, uh, trust God, sir. <laughs> Trust God, sir. Trust God, sir. Your house rent is the least of your problems. <laughs> tonight, tonight, I'll give you five minutes. Just thank God because you are confident of his word. Five minutes. Go ahead, everybody. Everybody. Ah. Eh, that ordinary small diagnosis of something in your body. You are now beginning to, to, to doubt whether you will live long. Come on, come off it. Thank God. He will keep you alive. He will preserve you. You will come to full, right, full old age. Thank Him. Yeah. Even if what you are going through was by your mistake. Uh -huh, so said I will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy and that's you thank you yay ulian grana mo krindele shade ba randala mama mama ndele ba riblo no bolo ndele baba thank him for his faithfulness Aya na na mangele le matuto soli ala bale na bala ba. Oh yes. Mandari aga mandele boroge de le bakia. Dele do rosta dele de bana ba. Yes Lord. Yes. 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 Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Faithful is he. Faithful is he. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it.
spirits are stirred up not stirred up by excitement but stirred up by your spirit thank you for strengthening the spirits of your people thank you Lord Jesus for great things that Lord I am about to bring forth thank you Jesus you know, the Lord is saying to some of you stop looking at the wrong or negative references sometimes you may not find anybody around you that has overcome something but you might as well be the first person somebody hearing what I'm saying so don't look at negative references he didn't say looking for references he said looking unto Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith so look to Jesus that's what you gotta do and it doesn't matter how surrounded you are by negative references you will not go their way your own case will be according to the word of the Lord I'll say it again your own case is going to be according to the word of the Lord I said again, your own case is going to be according to the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Were you blessed by that word tonight? Amen.